Hello and welcome. We have a fascinating guest for you to meet tonight. My guest is Gulgan Kayam, who is the new, relatively new, Director of Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy, a new position here in Minneapolis. She is going to talk with us about her new job, about a creative index that she's been working hard on, and about her career as a performance artist and theater uh, producer. And so I think you're going to enjoy meeting her. Welcome, oh, Logan. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Your new job, let's just sort of define it for people right in get-go here. You started in August of 2011. Mm -hmm. And how do you explain it to someone if you're on an airplane and trying to define briefly what you do? Well, uh, my official title is Director of Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy. And really what it refers to is um, a position that works across the city. Um, the mission of what I'm there to do is really to develop the social and economic capital for the city of Minneapolis, leveraging the creative sector. So essentially, um, I work across the city. I work with partners. I create partnerships and help them um, happen and help develop projects with an arts and culture focus. And uh, so that's hopefully, um, hopefully that helps explain what I do. It's, it's a little conceptual and difficult for people to understand I, sometimes. Yes, it is hard to understand. And maybe if you could give us um, an example of yeah. one of your projects, that would be a way to kind of understand it yeah. better. In fact, um, there's, um, there's two um, projects I could talk about. Uh, one is with the convention center. The convention center has changed some of its um, strategic planning and has been really interested in engaging the local community. And it also has this goal to put out uh, some sort of creative something on its plaza. Initially, mm -hmm. it thought it was going to be some sort of sculpture. And they approached me, asking me to help develop a project uh, with a community partner. And um, I sat down and looked, at, looked over what their goals were, this idea of connecting with the community, the idea they wanted something creative there. And they also wanted to sort of um, really become a, a more of a, a community center, so a place where people locally would mm. come, not just people mm. coming to conventions. And so we developed a project called the Creative City Challenge. And um, I put in some of my goals, the goals of my work, into that project. Um, and we developed a, a competition um, mm -hmm. whereby we're asking people to develop an idea for the plaza of the convention center and that idea has to be based on some of the values of the convention center in the city so it has to be eco-focused it has to be uh, engaging physically as well as just engaging mm -hmm. um, it has to ha be a way for people to understand better what minneapolis is about and we call that a portal into minneapolis and it's a bonus for us if people can also also get a sense of the creative community here so um, we actually launched this project in the fall and we had quite a few uh, applicants online uh, mm -hmm. and then the community got to vote for uh, all these ideas and then the five top vote getters were invited to um, uh, present their ideas in greater detail and refine them because they're going to you know, one of them will be selected by a jury that the city has put together uh, who, who will be selecting them. So I hope that kind of describes yeah, a good, one of these good projects. good example of yeah. bringing a lot of people together, too. Right. I call that temporary urbanism. Mm. So it's, in, it's inviting a greater uh, group of people into the conversation about what does our community mean in terms of our physical infrastructure. Um, some of the ideas are really exciting and really um, diverse and, ch and challenging and uh, really um, it, it's created quite a, a lot of buzz in the community, just sort of imagining what could, what could we put out there that someone visiting could, could uh, you know, get a sense of who we are and also something that we want to see there. And it would happen every year. Well, that's a, a great example and it sounds like a fun, fun project. Um, you're a London uh, person by, by uh, birth. Um, and I remember reading that you said cities need to celebrate what is unique about them. So when you came here to go to the U, right, uh, way back in 1990, what did you see and what do you still see 
about Minneapolis that is unique. I think um, sometimes someone from another country can look at it, much, look at a city much more objectively. Yeah, um, well, I have to correct you. I wasn't born in London. I was actually born in Cyprus, which is oh, an island okay. right. in the Mediterranean. But right. I grew up in London. My family okay. migrated to London, where I grew up. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, what did I find when I... One of the things that I was really struck by here was the access to nature. And that's mm. actually something that I really enjoy about this region. Um, Minneapolis has an amazing chain of lakes, and they're all public. Um, and it just, it just creates an incredible um, synergy between an urban center mm -hmm. and this ease of access into something, you know, as powerful as the lakes and the waterfall at Minnehaha. You know, I live close to Minnehaha Creek, mm -hmm. so I get to enjoy that. So, and the um, river And the connecting. river. So that, that sort of mm -hmm. connection and synergy with nature is, I think, one thing that um, sets Minneapolis apart from other cities. And I certainly know in terms of uh, when I've spoken to other urbanists that this, uh, our chain of lakes is really unique. And um, actually... Uh, uh, I don't know yeah. of any other city that maybe has, that does have such, such a lot of nature within it. Right, um, but also the fact that they're public actually makes them unique. Because mm -hmm. while there are other cities with lakes, they're not always publicly accessible. Right. And so that decision somewhere in the past to keep those public have created this amazing, um, you know, they become focal points for people. Mm -hmm. I live not too far from Lake Harriet, and that's one of the places I always walk around. So I'm sure that's as normal for many people here. So the we ease of some, access. Some forefathers to think, don't yes, we, in terms yes. of So that, like that's just something Worth. in Minneapolis I think is really unique, the sort of year-round access to nature. I ski in the winter, so you know, I can easily access that also in the park system. Mm -hmm. when, when you talk about the creative economy, um, you and I had an interesting uh, chat yesterday about how, how broad you look at creativity in terms of professionals and others um, contributing. Um, define for us how you're looking at creativity in terms of um, studying and making proposals and, and working in your new role. Yep, so um, the definition of the creative economy um, that I'm looking at, so I have this uh, index, this measurement that I've just recently completed, and uh, the definition of the creative economy in that index is broader than the city has ordinarily done before. In the past, the city has measured the creative economy from the point of view of the institutions. Um, so, for example, the Guthrie Theatre, and the city has measured the jobs within the Guthrie Theatre, and then uh, including the janitor. Mm -hmm. So, looking at the creative economy, like any sector really, so looking at it from the point of view of institutions and the jobs that those <coughs> institutions bring into the city. Um, this definition of the creative economy that we're now looking at actually broadens that, looks at for-profit uh, industries, so not just the non-profit institutions. It looks at uh, design and architecture, not just the fine arts. Um, it looks at a highly creative occupations, so it takes it out to camera operators, those people behind the camera, not just in front of the camera. It looks at photographers of all kinds in the graphics industry, and not just fine arts. So it really broadens out that definition of creativity to include all kinds of creative industries as well as the fine arts. And, and that is part of the big project to look at what the arts and creativity are bringing to the city, right? Correct, Economically. yes. Um, I read in one of your index um, slides that we're number six in terms of a creative economy here in Minneapolis. Is that correct? Am the I Minneapolis, right? yep, yep. The metropolitan area, the Minneapolis metropolitan area, is six in the nation. So um, the cities above us are Washington D.C., New York, L.A., San Francisco, and Boston. And we're and number I was surprised six. Number one is Washington. Correct. I somehow would have guessed New York. No, Washington DC actually has a very large metropolitan area. And also if you've ever been to Washington, you, you just think about all those institutions True. located mm -hmm. in Washington that mm -hmm. really, you know, the Smithsonian institutions, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Library of Congress, mm -hmm. these are all 
huge institution, so it doesn't surprise me at all that Washington should be number one. So it's Washington, New York, um, LA, LA, San Francisco, San Francisco and Boston. Boston, Minneapolis. Correct. So have we been at about that position for a long time? Or well, this is know? the first time we've actually done this measure. Oh, so okay. this so is our first know. opportunity to, to measure ourselves against other cities. And so, so we don't know what we were in the past. We, uh, we can only talk about what we know now. Um, but we can, I mean, this measure in, in has three ingredients. It looks at jobs and employment. It looks at retail sales and it looks at organizational revenue for nonprofits. And um, so in terms of uh, those other pieces, we can look into the past for jobs and employment. So I do have information in the past for that, so I can look at the trend over time. And you're looking at things like, are there more writers or less than there used to be? Correct, yes. More photographers? more camera operators or whatever. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes, and I, I'm tr I've tracked. What are some tracked. of the things you've learned that, that um, you find most interesting? Yeah, um, well, uh, I, actually I, f I find the whole thing really interesting, yeah. but um, in terms of jobs and employment, we've learned that the creative um, jobs, are, the creative economy in the jobs are, are really um, resilient. So when we've measured um, the creative jobs against all jobs in the city, and we found out that creative jobs are 5% of, of the mm -hmm. total workforce. Um, we have 20,000 uh, em employees, you know, workers in the creative economy. Um, we also have seen that just as uh, the rest of the economy has gone down, so has the creative economy, and it trends very, very closely. It doesn't show huge declines and huge increases, which is actually very good because it shows consistency and stability, which is, I think, ver very so good news. So people keep coming to our city to be creative workers. Right, and that's mm -hmm. relatively stable. However, mm -hmm. in recent years, in the last uh, 10 years, we've seen actually a plateauing of creative jobs. Mm -hmm. So while the rest of the uh, economy has begun to trend up in jobs, creative jobs have actually not trended. Mm -hmm. It's actually been decreasing That's slightly. not good news, is that it? it over, not recently, right. And um, one of the reasons behind that is because the housing decline has really impacted mm -hmm. good middle class jobs in the creative sector. So um, architecture and design has taken a huge hit, as has landscape architecture. Anything connected mm -hmm to housing has mm -hmm. taken sure, a hit. That makes sense, doesn't right. go And so what really we're seeing that reflected in the jobs numbers. Uh, there are other um, workers, occupations that have uh, declined as well, but architecture is actually one of the biggest ones. And you made the point the other day with, with uh, me that so many people in the creative sector are working several jobs. Correct, yeah. What's and they're independent workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm for the most part, right? right? So one of the reasons we were interested in this particular measurement, which I, as I explained to you before, um, it actually comes from a, a national data aggregator. And okay. it's, uh, so it comes from an organization that's called Westar for the Western States Urban Arts Federation. And it, it developed the measure and other cities around the country are taking it on and looking at it because it's a reliable measure. It's something we can look at every year. So it's not something you invented, no. but you brought it to Correct. the city. Correct, we have bought into it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, I'm kind of tied to the things it wants to measure. I'm, so therefore, however, that, that, that's the sort of restriction but the advantage is that we have longitudinal measures. We, this is something that we can look at over a long period of time and track. And they're very, as I mentioned, very reliable, reliable because it comes from, from data nationally. Um, so one of the things that we were also interested was the broadening of the creative sector into the things that I mentioned earlier, into these uh, broader definitions of these creative occupations, because we know that workers aren't necessarily tied in this industry to institutions. Mm -hmm. What's characteristic about these workers is that they're independent and they have mm -hmm. multiple income streams. Exactly, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, if you wanna take another example, in another sector, maybe um, you can look at web development. That, that, there's, that, that's trending in the same way now, where you have independent workers mm -hmm. who are you know, creating their own work and, and getting contracts. 
that's the same with the creative sector and historically that has been actually typical of a creative worker. So now we're tracking the incidence of employment. We're no longer tracking just the uh, in this industry. We're, we're tracking the in, in incidence of employment. Do you think, I mean, we're talking web designers, high tech people, do you mm -hmm. think many, many sectors in terms of our broad uh, kinds of work, work possibilities are going to become more freelance based it seems to me that that is a, a long-term trend. Absolutely, you agree? I actually agree with that. Yep, we're seeing that um, actually all over the country, um, because you know part of it is the decline. You know, part of it is that people are losing their jobs, and so in an effort to sort of construct some you know uh, work, um, a lot of people are seeing a growth in contract jobs. Uh, not a growth in stable jobs within organizations. So this is a way that organizations can actually save some money. Mm -hmm. They can hire a contract mm -hmm. worker. They don't have to play, pay for benefits. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's a little cheaper for them. And for those people who are independent in nature, having a freelance lifestyle is a very positive thing. It's well, not it, for everybody. It has pluses and minuses. Yes, it does. Yeah, it, the, the plus is you're free. You can really kind of choose, um, mm -hmm. you know, your, your work schedule, where you work, all those. When you want to take a trip. It, exactly. <laughs> the minus is you lose stability. Yes. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, pension and benefits, those kinds of things, you have to, uh, you have to kind of make that yourself. Mm -hmm. So it, and also predictability. So, and you, as a, a artist yourself, know this from. I mean, you are speaking <laughs> <laughs> from your own personal yeah. history, as well as a representative of the city now, aren't you? Yeah, and that's got to help. Yeah, I mean, she has been a performance artist, as I mentioned. She formed a group called Skewed Visions that won the City Pages Artists of the Year Award and. 2004. I mean, you've been immersed in the arts. You just told me about a documentary you are working on right now. Um, so you bring to this job deep understanding of the pros and the cons. Yep, and mm -hmm. uh, and I actually spent 10 years working as a consultant as well. So I've I've been that um, multiple income stream mm -hmm. person, balancing my mm -hmm. artistic practice, teaching at the University of Minnesota, doing contract work. Um, so I, I've, I know from a very immediate experience mm -hmm. what it means, and I also know, um, you know, sometimes you do need stability. Um, right. You do or need, you know, crave it. <laughs> well, you, when you have mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. you need to support them. So how do you do that? Or when you have and exactly when you have needs like that, and that's actually one of my concerns in in terms of making this report is I want to create a platform on which to sort of demonstrate that the creative community does bring a lot of value to the table and, and serious economic value. It's not just something that we can imagine now, it's something we can actually say in the data, look, this is what the data shows. It shows that this, this sector actually has a lot of value to bring. Tell us um, the, the most important number we should take away from this in terms of what the creative workforce is bringing to the city. It's a, a really quite substantial percentage, isn't it, of our total income here? Yep, so um, we could say that there's, in, in terms of this report, that there's 700 million that flows through the economy that the creative sector brings. Uh, of that 700 million, 430 million is in just in retail sales. So that's what we're, you know, when I say that, it's really ticket purchasing, it's um, purchasing an artwork or some sort of item. Um, that is a huge so amount. So retail in the arts. Correct. Right. right. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the demand for the product. So tell us that number again is for 430 million. Right. 430 million. That, that number surprised me, Gogan, when I read that because I thought, I didn't think it would be that high buying tickets to dance, to the orchestra, to, you know, whatever event is in included, um, that's a lot of tickets. Yes, it is. And it's not just tickets, it's book sales, photography sales, right. it's um, object, purchasing an mm -hmm. object. Um, we took another sector to sort of compare it to, to say, okay, um, what does this compare to? 
and we put it up against sports sales. And we found that the creative sector actually does very well when put, when put against sports. It's actually 70% of sports retail. 70. 70%. <laughs> now, that is another number that surprised me. Yep. That's very, very good. I mean, Minneapolis is known to be a supporter of the arts and the creative world. Um, but still, that's a wonderful number. It is Are a wonderful people number. surprised when you're yes. starting to uh, tell them about the index results? Absolutely, and, and, and especially that particular figure because mm -hmm. we do talk about um, how much sports brings to us right. in terms and of we're economic all impact. Aware of sports. Right, but we don't really talk much about how much the creative community mm -hmm. brings to us in terms of economic mm -hmm. impact. And tied to that, there's a value add to that in that um, one of the things I talk about is that the creative economy is uh, obviously it's, it's products and services, but it's also this other piece, which is this social value. So mm -hmm. you, can, you can buy the product, but it can also be the climate in which you have the relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's what the arts sort of bring in. So not only are we um, reaping the benefit of these products and services in, in a monetary way, but we're also seeing um, you know, our communities become more livable because mm -hmm. we like to be around these events mm -hmm. and, and galleries mm -hmm. and all these other things that are around Art us. Art fairs in the Correct. summer. And you don't have to buy anything to mm -hmm. feel good to about. Right, and that, that's the whole the Creative City Challenge that I was talking about earlier. You really don't have to purchase anything to engage with it. So that social capital piece is what we get out of that. We get a, an, a feeling of well-being. We want to mm -hmm. be here. We can actually uh, talk mm -hmm. about to outsiders why we want to live in Minneapolis. I was at a, a dedication of a piece of sculpture at um, a little lake by my home and I, I happened to meet the artist and I told him how much I loved the sculpture and he said, well, consider it your sculpture. And it was such a, I'm sure he said that to many people who admired it, but it was such a sense then of um, Oh, sort of ownership on this beautiful spot on the lake where this sculpture is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I thought, what a, a wonderful feeling to, to have that. And that's kind of what you're talking about, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Magnified, right. you know. In fact, in, in among cities right now, that conversation about attachment to a community, mm -hmm. you know, we all... And to a place. Right? And to a place mm -hmm. is very, very... Um, the, the discussion is very vibrant at the moment. Um, the Knight Foundation, for example, did a survey called the Soul of the Community, mm -hmm. looking at why people live where they live. Mm -hmm. And one of the things it found is that people nowadays, because uh, you know, people can work virtually almost anywhere, people are choosing to live in communities that they feel strongly attached to. And how do people get attached to communities? And why are they attached? Why are they attached mm -hmm. to communities? One of them is because they've connected somewhere, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. And the way you can connect to a community, one way you can connect, obviously, is through family. The other way is through arts and culture. Mm -hmm. You can you can have an experience here. You can like my sculpture. Right, you can feel connected <laughs> uh -huh. to something. Right. Uh, I live not too far from the rabbit. Along oh, the right, creek, right. and That's I smile rabbit. every time I go yeah. past there because yeah. I see that rabbit He's right cared on for. Mini right? Hop Parkway, if you haven't seen right. the rabbit. So, um, so therefore, yeah. I can tell the people around that that piece. Um, really mm -hmm. care for it. So mm -hmm. therefore, you know, that, that's what we're talking about. It's, you know, the arts have this intangible measure that we cannot really measure. And if we didn't, if we lost those kind of things and lost that big part of our culture, I, I think it would be so hard to, to um, get back where we, we are now. Um, I just read a, a little piece in the Harvard Magazine, um, of all places, but the person writing said, with the push on for math and science with our kids, are we going to lose what we do have in terms of emphasis on the importance of culture? I'm using culture broadly here, but um, what do you do? You worry about that? Um, well, I I because we only have so much money to yes, spend. yeah. I, I I actually wish that the conversation would be more about innovation because um, what, what culture does or what the arts do 
is it helps people think outside of themselves. It helps people imagine a future. It helps people be creative. Mm. Um, certainly, um, there's a skill that you get as an artist that you learn because that's something you have to acquire. But then there's this, I, there's this creativity, this free, free thinking, which um, the arts encourage and stimulate. And I think everyone is creative. I think mm -hmm. many people have creative ideas. And uh, as do scientists, that, perhaps. yeah. As do mm -hmm. I mean, people are creative in all kinds of right. ways, and scientists mm -hmm. are creative just as much as engineers are creative, just as much as artists. I think if we lose the arts piece of it, we lose a, a piece of that kind of innovation that is very hard to get back because we know that innovation comes out of diversity, not just mm -hmm. racial and ethnic, but out of diverse thinking. And we need all kinds of thinking nowadays in order to handle the kinds of problems that are in our communities. I, we are out of time, but I wanted to ask you more about diversity because we perhaps aren't ranked very high um, or as high as we'd like to be in terms of appreciating diversity here. Um, but, but that's another interview, another conversation. Thank you so much for coming down. Um, we're going to put a website up that will give people access to the Creative Index Report, uh, which Gogan has been speaking about. And I think you will find it fascinating. Um, it's, it's beautifully done. So go to minneapolismn.gov forward slash coordinator forward slash arts. And we'll put that on the screen for you now. So you can uh, look for that uh, as you uh, think more about this interview. Well, thank you very much. It's thank you. Been it's been fascinating. a pleasure. Fascinating, and best of luck with your your new work and uh, the important advocacy that you are doing for all all of us. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>